Join Midway Baptist Church for Sunday School at 945, worship service at 11, and Wednesday night service at 7. Pastor Steve and Pastor Josh invite you to join us as we seek to glorify God by building the church of tomorrow today through fervent prayer, evangelism, discipleship, and family ministry. morning church this is the day that the Lord has made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it I know that you are not here it's obvious for me I look out at the the pews and you're they're empty but I hope that you are there in uh, listening and participating in worship this morning I pray that you will be blessed on this the Lord's day uh, I am excited that, uh, on this day to be able to bring the message of the Lord to you. So I ask that you would continue to pray for us as we pray for you. So let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, thank you for the opportunity, Lord, once again to lift our voice before a, a God who is so gracious, so holy, so mighty, so powerful. And Lord, we know that we're living in days that are just unprecedented in, in the fact that, Lord, the church is is not able to gather together as we once did because of this virus and because of the need for social distancing. But Lord, we know that, Father God, that Lord, our hearts are connected together through you, O oh Lord. And we pray that, Father, that as we cannot be here in brick and mortar, uh, but we are here as the church of God today. Help us to, to be the church by praying for our neighbors, by praying for our families, by praying for our government government, praying for uh, the, the hospitals and doctors and first uh, responders, oh Lord. Help us to remember, oh God, to pray, God, thy will be done. Let it be used to glorify you, oh Lord, we pray. Father, I pray for the service this morning. I pray that you would just bless the time and I pray that you'd bless the churches around us, oh Lord, that are meeting together in, in different ways, using technology and, and Lord, communicating with their folks in, in a way that they can present the, the Word of God. I pray that, Father, that you would take your word of truth today, speak into our hearts and into our lives the words of God. And I ask that, Father, that you, O oh Lord, would move me out of the way and hide me behind the cross, that it not be my words, but your word, O oh Lord, that is proclaimed this morning. Pray that you bless the music and, and all that we do today. Lord, may you just be exalted and lifted up in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. This morning we have some special music for you by uh, none other than Andy Griffith. And uh, we are always grateful that uh, we can say to the world, we have Andy Griffith singing for you this morning. So I hope that you'll be blessed by his songs this morning. Here he is. Life is easy. When you're up on the mountain And you've got peace of mind Like you've never known But things change when You're down in the valley Don't lose 
at its best Now it's down in the valleys of trials and temptations That's when your faith is really put to the test For the God on the mountain is still God in the to be here with you. Uh, just a few announcements. First off, if we have any visitors in the house of the Lord today, if you'll raise your hand high in the air. Don't do that. I can't see you. However, if you are visiting with us on either our website or our Facebook page and watching, please let us know. Um, we'd be happy to reach out to you um, if you have any questions, especially about a relationship with Jesus. Um, you can get us on our Facebook page, our website. You can also call us 336-246-2012. What I do want to tell you is that uh, Pastor Steve and I are excited. We're actually going to be able to do a special program for Easter. And we will be posting more details about that at the first of the week. So be sure to check in to that. And then the ark still needs some items. So if you're out and about shopping, um, which is tough to do these days, and you see any of these items and you want to help the ark, Ash Really Cares, help our neighbors, um, just pick them up if you can. And what they are is uh, pinto beans, other types of beans, dry goods, macaroni, oatmeal, canned uh, goods like canned pastas, a Chef Boro D or spaghetti, things like that. And we still have our tub outside the fellowship hall there. It's uh, got a list or a paper on it that says ARC needs. So you just drop them off there for your convenience. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is, is we want to thank you for your faithful giving. We know times are tough right now. But we also know, just as well as you do, that none of this could be done, none of these ministries could be done at Midway, if not for you. So again, thank you. And just a reminder, with that, you can give online if you go to our website and click on the Giving tab. And uh, you'll have to set up an account, but after that, you'll be able to make the contribution uh, as you see fit. And just want to let you know, many folks are taking advantage of this right now. And uh, even though we've been unable to come to the church building, uh, we can still support the local church and the ministries that we're doing. So again, we say thank you because we truly know that if it wasn't for you, we would not be able to do this. And last, I want to share just some lyrics from one of my favorite songs. Um, Matt, Mar Matt Marr is a Christian uh, music artist and he does great music, but he put out a, a new song recently called Alive and Breathing. I just want you to think about these lyrics for a moment. What holds your heart, what stirs your soul, what matters come to mind, the cares you keep, the thoughts you think, 
It's not all wasted time. Seek and you will find. Joy still comes in the morning. Hope still walks with the hurting. If you're alive and breathing, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, church. Thank you. Until next time, God bless. and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often easy enough. It's flour, water, a little salt, herbs if you want more flavor. Normally you'd add yeast, but not at Passover. No, at Passover we cannot wait for the bread to rise. Our deliverance from Pharaoh is at hand. So the story goes. Passover is always the same. We eat the bread, we drink the wine, there's lamb, bitter herbs, we remember our deliverance and our coming deliverance. Next year in Jerusalem, we always say, Messiah will come. It's always the same. But sometimes it, it seems so far away, so complicated. But this year, things were, well, Two men followed our servant home from fetching water. They were wanting a place to celebrate Passover with their rabbi, and my husband and I, we had an extra room. So I baked the unleavened bread, and I delivered it when they arrived. The rabbi graciously introduced himself, and a horde of 12 men followed him into our upper room. I'd heard about this rabbi. Wild tales of healing blind men, raising the dead, and walking on water. So naturally, I stood outside the, the door and I peeked around the corner. And that is when he turned it all upside down. You see, the person who sits at the head of the table isn't supposed to get up and wash other people's feet. But this rabbi, he was moving from man to man, washing each of their dirty feet. Well, I pulled back before I was seen, but still, 
and listened. I stayed and listened. His words were sure, kind, but, but like fire, like no rabbi I'd ever heard. If you see me, then you see the Father, he said. He also said that he would be broken for them. He talked of the new covenant and being children rather than orphans. And as the bread was passed, the unleavened bread of deliverance, he said, I am the living bread. Living bread. What could we have understood about that at the time? A new covenant was coming, and our deliverance was at our doorstep. Little did we know that our entire world was about to be turned upside down. Aren't you glad, church, that our world has been turned upside down? Jesus has come to make that which was wrong right. The world, unfortunately, has not seen all that it needs to see, and Christ is still using you and I to show them the way. Today is a special day. It's a day of preparation. It's a day of celebration. It's a day that uh, we look to Scripture and we find that uh, as we begin this week, it's oftentimes called Holy Week. A week in, uh, of preparation, of, of celebrating and getting ready for Easter. This morning I want to talk to you about uh, what this Sunday is all about. And we call it oftentimes Palm Sunday. But I want to talk to you about the road to the cross. After Jesus uh, um, did all of His ministry, after He did everything that He had intended to do to, to set the stage... He then sets his face towards Jerusalem. We pick up our story today in the book of Luke, in Luke chapter 19, and I want to read verses 28 through 40 with you this morning just to share the story of what we call Passover or week or what we call uh, the triumphal entry or Palm Sunday. And it says, and when he had thus spoken, he went up before ascending up into Jerusalem. And it came to pass, when he had come nigh to Bethpage and Bethany, at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in which is your entering. You shall find a coat tied there, um, yet never man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, why do you loose him? Thus say, he shall uh, say unto him, uh, the, the Lord needeth him. And when they had sent him away and found even as he had said unto them, and they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, why loose ye the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he had come nigh, even unto the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice and all the mighty work that they had seen saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. 
May the Lord add the blessing of the reading of His Word. And now may you hear the blessing of the Lord as I attempt to preach this message to you this morning. After Jesus had come down off the Mount of Transfiguration, instead of going straight up into heaven, He put His face towards the city of Jerusalem and purposely set Himself towards the cross. His disciples followed Him as He walked along the road to the cross. Preaching and teaching in various towns along the way as Jesus would, it was on this day, the day that we call Palm Sunday, that He finally reached His goal. This is the week that He enters into the city of Jerusalem to suffer and to die for the sins of the world. But you would hardly know this because of the amazing reception he received as he entered into the city of Jerusalem that day. The scene in which we just read in Jesus' life is often called the triumphal entry. Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem accompanied by the waving of palm branches and the cheering of the crowd and great anticipation. If you were a visitor to Jerusalem that day, unaware of uh, Jesus and His teaching, you would probably be wondering, what is going on here? What is this all about? Well, let's take a closer look at that Scripture passage this morning so that I might explain to you some of the details that you might not understand. First of all, Jesus presents Himself as Messiah. In verses 28 through 34, Jesus tells us He Himself, as He has said to His disciples, I am the Messiah. Now, how does Jesus make that claim? The first thing that we learn from this passage of Scripture and this triumphal entry is that Jesus presents Himself as the Messiah. The Messiah was coming deliverer that God had promised to the Jewish people many, many years before. The entire Old Testament looks forward to the coming of the Messiah. And Messianic expectation ran high among the Jewish people of Jesus' day. They were hungering for a Messiah. Jewish history was a long sequence of freedom and captivity of the nation of Israel. The Jewish people were currently under Roman rule and longed to be free again. They believed that when this Messiah would come, He would deliver them from the Romans and set them free. This was also a significant week in the Jewish calendar. Yes, it is the week of Passover, when the Jewish people celebrated the God's miraculous deliverance of Israel from the Egyptians under the leadership of Moses. Crowds uh, of traveling pilgrims traveled to the holy city of Jerusalem for this wonderful annual event. Many hundreds of thousands would come. Crowds, traveling pilgrims, now have arrived at Jerusalem. Religious fever or fervor and zeal was high. Part of the messianic hope was that God would send another one like Moses to deliver the people like he did in those days. And now here comes Jesus, a prophet, widely known for his miracles and his teaching, walking the road to Jerusalem along with his disciples, and a growing crowd of fellow pilgrims follow There was usually a wide uh, conjecture that Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus had already told His disciples that He was. Now He prepares to enter into Jerusalem at the beginning of this holy week. Jesus presents Himself as Messiah to the people of Jerusalem. How does He do that? Through many different things that take place. First of all, let's talk about the Mount of Olive. How did Jesus present Himself? The details of particular significance in these next verses, verses 28 and 29. The first mention of of the Mount of Olives is found in verse 29. 
As he approached Bethpage and Bethany on the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples ahead into the city. The Mount of Olives was more than just a geographical marker. The Mount of Olives was a messianic implication here. When Ezekiel in the Old Testament prophesied about the Jewish exiles who were held captive in the country of Babylon, he prophesied about the restoration of Israel to the land, even as he had beheld a vision of the glory of the Lord departing from the temple, then from Jerusalem. We read in Ezekiel chapter 11 verse 23 that the glory of the Lord went out from within the city and stopped above the mountain east of it. And Ezekiel chapter 11 goes on to tell us this was the Mount of Olives. It marked the departure of God's glory from Jerusalem. But later on in Ezekiel, many chapters later in chapter 43, Ezekiel sees another vision of the Lord returning to Jerusalem from the east, implying that God's glory would re-enter Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, even as it had left. The people excited and expected to see a Messiah come that would deliver them, knowing that He would come from the Mount of Olives. It was no accident, my friends, that Jesus chose this particular place to enter Jerusalem from the east at the very location of the Mount of Olives. He was intentionally, deliberately presenting Himself as the Messiah coming to free people. But then we see a tethered colt. A second detail of significance is the tethered colt. Look again at verse 30. He sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and there enter in, and you'll find a colt that is tied up there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it to me. There are two things that are important about this colt that we need to understand. The first thing is that it was tied up. Now you think, well, that's pretty obvious. We don't want it wandering off. Now that may not seem significant to us at first, but would have, would have meant something very significant to the Jewish people of Jesus' day. Because this particular example is steeped in the Old Testament Scripture and fervently waiting for the Messiah. You might wonder, what does a tethered colt have to do with the Messiah? Well, one of the earliest prophecies about Messiah coming is found in the book of Genesis all the way back in chapter 49. Jacob, when he was old and dying, he gathered all of his sons around him and he prophesied about each one of them and their descendants. Of the particular interest is the prophecy about Judah. King David came out of the line of Judah. And later, Old Testament prophecy made it clear that the Messiah would also come from the tribe of Judah in the line of David. We read in Genesis chapter 49, The sepulcher was not departed from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs, and the obedience of the nations is his. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. He will wash his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. For the Jewish person meditating on the Messiah, the tethered colt would evoke associations with this prophecy in Genesis and further their association to Jesus being the Messiah. The second thing that we see about this cold is the fact that the donkey had never been ridden was also significant. Animals that were meant for sacred or royal uses were not used for ordinary tasks, but set apart for a greater purpose. This young donkey had never been ridden, had been set apart by God for the sacred purpose of uh, of the royal task of carrying the Messiah into the holy city on this first Palm Sunday. Then we see the name of the Lord. 
We see the Mount of Olives as an important descending place. We see the donkey as being a significant uh, item in which God uses to, to point himself to the Messiahship. But we also see Jesus using the word Lord here in verses 31 through 34. There's a third way that Jesus presents himself as Messiah in the passage, and that is through the use of the word, the Lord. As we look at verses 31 through 34, the word Lord has several meanings in Jesus' day. It could refer to God, of course, or to a master, or even just to the owner of something. In fact, when Jesus first told his disciples to go and say the Lord needs it, that meaning could have simply said that, that Jesus owned the cult, the owner needed it. Luke is careful, however, to point out that though the donkey's uh, uh, actual owners were not uh, um, Jesus, but they were there, and when they asked, why are you loosing our colt? They said unto him, because the Lord is in need of it. The name Lord has a messianic title to it. In Psalms 110 is a messianic prompt. Uh, uh, prophecy. It begins with these words. The Lord says to my Lord, sit on my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. After Jesus entered Jerusalem, he will use the very verse to engage the Pharisees concerning the title of Lord as it applies to the person of the Messiah. Jesus used other words and other times he used the word Lord for himself and freely accepted the title from the lips of others. And here, at the triumphal entry of Jesus in Jerusalem, it was just another way in which Jesus himself presents to the crowd that he is the Messiah. Now we see Jesus presenting himself to the crowd as Messiah. Now we look at the people proclaiming that Jesus is the Messiah. In verses 35 through 38, Jesus not only presents himself as Messiah at the triumphal entry, the people also proclaim Jesus to be the Messiah. We see this in a number of ways as well. Again, the entry on a donkey. The importance of, uh, of how Jesus enters in is as important as, as his entering in. First, Jesus enters on the donkey is highly significant for several reasons. Look at verse 35. They brought it, the donkey, to Jesus, threw his, their coats or cloaks on the, the, the colt and put Jesus on it. Notice disciples put Jesus on the donkey. Jesus sent them to get the donkey for this purpose, but they put him on the donkey as he entered into the city. He didn't do it himself. They did it for him. They did it because of who he was. So why is Jesus riding a donkey important? First, by placing Jesus on the donkey for the entry into the city, the people were proclaiming him as king. Not everyone who rode, however, into the city on a donkey was a king. But being placed on the donkey and riding into town in a celebratory processional such as it was is unmistakable sign of kingship. For example, in the Old Testament, when David proclaimed his son Solomon king, we find a very similar scenario take place in Jerusalem. We read that they put Solomon on King David's mule and escorted him uh, to Gion. And Zadok, the priest, took the horn of oil from the sacred tent, tent and anointed Solomon. Then they sounded the trumpets and all the people shouted, Long live King Solomon. All the people went up after playing flutes and rejoicing greatly, so much that the ground shook by the noise. Secondly, it is significant that Jesus rolled into the city on a donkey rather than on a horse. The horse 
was a military animal. And when a king rode into the city on a horse, it signified a military victory. The donkey was used for civil or ceremonial, peaceful occasions. By choosing a donkey rather than a horse, Jesus shows that he's coming in peace, that he is the prince of peace. Just should have been a sign to the crowd and to the disciples that he was not entering into Jerusalem to overthrow the Roman government at this time, but coming to offer peace to their lives. Thirdly, the donkey figured prominently in one of the messianic prophecies of Zechariah. And it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Zechariah 9 9. And these verse. In this verse, Zechariah describes the prophecy of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And so Jesus enters on a donkey. was very significant to the messianic prophecies that have been given throughout time. By placing him on the donkey and proceeding ahead of him into the city of Jerusalem, the people were proclaiming Jesus as Messiah and king. And then we see the spreading of their cloaks. The spreading of cloaks was also a significant event in the proclamation of the Messiah or the kingship of Jesus. Going back again to Luke chapter 19, we read, and they threw their cloaks on the colt. And as they went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. It's interesting. Luke does not mention the palm branches at all, just the spreading of the cloaks. In fact, Luke is the only gospel that does not mention the branches at all. So here we are on Palm Sunday, talking about uh, uh, the gospel and reading the gospel that doesn't even mention the palm branches. But yet, we understand there's something that Luke wants us to see that is so important. The palm branches were used for celebrations. They were also used as a symbol of a a military victory, which shows that the people still thought that Jesus was coming to deliver them from Rome. But Luke wanted us to understand that he was coming and offering his life as an atonement for their sins to offer them peace, not a military victory. So what did the spreading of the cloaks really specify? The spreading of the cloaks was a sign of respect for a king. We read in the Old Testament that that when Elisha, uh, the prophet, anointed Jehu as king, the people hurried and took their cloaks and spread them under uh, under the bare steps. And then they blew the trumpet and shouted, Jehu is king. The symbolicness of this, of spreading their cloaks under his feet, was a, to the king was an act the of submission. The spreading of the cloaks was a... It was an act of submission. It indicates your willingness to bow before the king and yield the right of your possessions to him and his rule. This was yet another way that the crowd proclaimed Jesus as Messiah and king. The praises of his people are significant as well. In verses 37 and 38, we find that that thirdly, uh, Jesus is proclaiming, their people are proclaiming that he is because of their praise. I started off this morning by telling you that this is the day that the Lord has made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. We, the people of God, need to give praise to God. On this Palm Sunday, we need to be thanking God for the privilege of being able to serve God. Yes, we we have an empty building here, but we can have a full heart before the Lord if we will worship Him where we are. So the actual praises of the people saying as Jesus entered into Jerusalem, 
When we look at verses 38 and 30, uh, 37 and 38, we, we hear the song in which they were singing. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began joyfully to praise God in a loud voice of all the miracles that he had done. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. The whole crowd joined in the chorus of praise in loud voices of celebration and joy. The first phrase comes from Psalms 118, which reads in part, This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Notice how they had changed slightly the words to say, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. The praise of the people was the third way that the people proclaimed Jesus to be the Messiah as he entered into Jerusalem. The first thing was that Jesus proclaimed that he was Messiah. The people now proclaim that he is Messiah. And third, Jesus accepts their praise of him as Messiah. It's so good to know that Jesus accepts our praise. He accepts our acknowledgement of who He is. He accepts us when we come and we say, Blessed is the Lord. Blessed is the Savior. God is my Redeemer. Jesus is Messiah. Jesus presents Himself as Messiah at this triumphal entry. The people proclaim Him as Messiah and finally Jesus accepts their praise of him as Messiah. There is, a, of course, the objection of the Pharisees. <laughs> Boy, is that not familiar. As you know, that even today, when, when Jesus is being praised, not everyone is happy about it. That was the case then, and it is the case now. Not everyone is happy when we are praising the Lord. Back then, it was the case that not everyone along the road of Jerusalem was happy about Jesus' triumphal entry. In verse 39, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. The Pharisees knew that, that what was happening. They saw Jesus coming into the city from the east off the Mount of, of Olives. They saw him riding on the donkey as the people waved the palm branches and laid their cloaks on the road before him. They heard the people praising God and proclaiming Jesus as king just as he passed by the Mount of Olives. And understanding the implications of all of these things, the people were proclaiming Jesus as Messiah. And so they told Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Or in other words, they simply were saying, Jesus, tell them to stop acknowledging you for who you really are. We even hear that today. But my friends, I encourage you, continue to acknowledge Jesus for who he really is, our Savior. And then Jesus' affirmation of the people's praise. Verse 40. And Jesus makes a statement as he, he responds to the, the Pharisees and their request. You know what? Any good teacher who was not the Messiah would have rebuked his disciples and said, Listen, do not proclaim me as the Messiah, for I cannot hold that title. But not Jesus. Jesus knew he was the Messiah. He welcomed it. He accepted it. He said, Let it continue to praise me. Jesus did not rebuke because he was the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. In fact, instead of rebuking them, he actually affirmed the people's praise. He said this, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. I don't know about you, but I love this phrase. It's a wonderfully ambiguous phrase, and yet at the same time, such a clear affirmation, Jesus accepted the people's praise of Him as Messiah. 
Jesus would much rather have your praise and my praise than, than the rocks or the, 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 the trees crying out to Him. He wants you and I to acknowledge that He is our Savior, our Messiah. The people were proclaiming Him as Messiah in those days. And my friends, I encourage you, proclaim Him as Messiah today. And Jesus will accept your praise. So now let me wrap it all up. Let me close out our time this morning with an application. Actually, with a question that leads to an application. What does Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem over 2,000 years ago mean to you and me today? Let me leave you with three applications that lead us to make a decision. And I hope that you will make that decision. First of all, we need to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. It is paramount for you and I to understand that Jesus Christ, the Christ, the, the, the living God, came to be Messiah. What the people proclaimed about Jesus on that first Palm Sunday... I now proclaim to you today, Jesus is Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the Savior. He came to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies. He came not to deliver Israel from the power of the Roman government, as the Jewish people thought He would. He came to deliver all people everywhere from all time from the power of sin. Even today, the power of Christ Death, burial, and resurrection has the power to set man free from their sin. The scripture in Acts tells us, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Second application is that we must serve Him as King. As Messiah, Jesus is not only Savior. There are many people that want a Savior. They want, a, they want someone to get them to heaven, but they don't want anybody to tell them what to do. My friends, the Lord has to be Lord of your life in order to be Savior of your life. As Messiah, Jesus not only Savior, but Lord. He is the king of the universe who entered Jerusalem that first Palm Sunday. His righteous and having salvation, gently riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey, Zechariah 9.9 reminded us. The people spread their cloaks beneath Jesus' feet as a sign of submission. The question for you and I today is, will we bow our knee to Christ? Will you submit to Him as Lord and serve Him as your King, having right to command you and to uh, demand of you to live His way and not your way? When Jesus comes back from heaven, and He will, He will not be riding on a donkey in peace, my friends. When Jesus comes back from heaven, He'll be riding on the white horse of victory, and he comes in battle to defeat his enemies. And you and I do not want to be one of his enemies. He will strike down the nations with a sharp sword. And that comes out of his mouth. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God. And we do not want to be here for that. Let these days in which we're living in be a reminder that we don't want to live absent from God. And then... Proclaim His praise. Jesus is the eternal Son of God. Who, the scripture says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 through 11, but made Himself of no reputation and took upon Himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in the fashion of a man, He humbled Himself and became obedient unto the death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. My friends, let me remind you, as he was on that first Palm Sunday, 
He is today. Jesus is worthy of all of our praise. Lift your voice before Him in praise. If you do not praise Him, if we do not praise Him, if, if His children do not praise Him, the very rocks will cry out. I would rather be the one praising the Lord than letting the rocks do my job. Will you call upon Him today as Savior and submit to Him as Lord? He has come to save all who will place their faith in the finished work of Calvary's cross. If you would, just bow your heads and and just focus your attention on this prayer. If the Spirit of the Lord leads you, you repeat this prayer or just ask God to do this in your heart. Dear Lord Jesus, I confess that I am a sinner, that I have fallen short of God's glory. My sin has separated me from your holiness. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for what Jesus came to do as he walked into Jerusalem that uh, Palm Sunday heading towards the cross. He died on that cross. He spilt his blood. He shed his life for my sin. I ask that you would come into my heart, that you would forgive me of my sins, cleanse me by the blood of Jesus Christ. And I make you the Lord of my life. I surrender my life to your life, my will to your will. Dear Lord Jesus, I confess that I need your salvation, your lordship in order to make it in this world. Lord, I also confess that if I ever want to see heaven, I must surrender myself to Jesus Christ and his salvation. I ask, Lord, that you would come into my heart and forgive me and cleanse me and make me your child. In Jesus' name. My friends, the Bible says that if we pray a prayer similar to that, if we acknowledge that we've sinned, if we acknowledge that He is the payment for our sins, that we surrender our lives and and accept His will in our life, then we shall be saved. If you prayed that prayer this morning, or if you need someone to talk to you more about that prayer this morning, please call the church office, 336-246-2012. Or you can email me personally, Pastor Steve at midwaybaptistnc.org. And I promise you, if you email me, I will email you back. I will get back to you. I will make every effort to share further with you or to help you further with your walk in the Lord. Now this next song that we're going to end with, and then Brother Josh is going to come back and have a benediction prayer. But this song that Brother Andy is going to sing for us speaks about that very gift of salvation. If you're still thinking about whether or not that you want to receive Jesus as your Savior, while this song is playing, please just ask God to speak to your heart and pray that prayer. Receive the Lord for His gift of salvation is for you today. May you receive it freely for He gave it to us. Really. Hear these words. I want to thank Jesus for the plan of salvation. Just to say, Lord, I love you, for you understand. I want to be there on that great judgment morning to touch all the and his hand. One morning at daybreak a crowd slowly gathered They were walking my 
Lord God. Oh, Calvary's here. So sad was the scene there. The birds hushed their singing. Like a lamb, he was humble. To his father's own will, I want to thank Jesus for the plan of salvation. Just to say, Lord, I love you, for you understand. judgment morning to touch all the nail in his feet and his hands to touch all the nail in his feet and his Amen, church. Just as Pastor Steve said, I want to reiterate that if you confess Jesus Christ as Lord with your mouth, now that doesn't make Him Lord. Jesus is already Lord. That means you submit your life to His Lordship. He has full reign over your life. And you confess with your mouth that He is Lord and believe in your heart God raised Him from the dead. You indeed will be saved, church. Just remember, Jesus Christ is the only name under heaven, given among men, by which we must be saved. Repent of your sin and turn to Him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, constantly reminded of what Isaiah said when he was in the throne room, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth, the entire earth, is filled with His glory. And Lord, that's a, a strong reminder to Jesus' words, as the Pharisees tried to rebuke him and the disciples for giving him praise, that if they do not, if we do not praise our King, that nature would cry out in our place. So Lord, I just pray right now that those that have experienced conviction in their soul and in their heart, from what was said this morning, Lord, that you would take your spirit, put your spirit into them, Lord, and draw them to yourself in truth, that they may submit their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ and His Lordship, Father, that they'd repent of their sin and they'd turn to You, and that they would take this seriously, Lord, because it is a serious thing. Father, we know that doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but You did promise that You'll never leave us nor forsake us. So Lord, I just ask again that your spirit would move in and through your people, those that you've called by your name this morning, that they would not just simply wave off the conviction as just a feeling of emotional draw, but Lord, that they would truly understand that Jesus Christ is the Lord of lords and King of kings. And Father, that 
as your people, we would continue to glorify God, magnify Jesus, and be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Well, we're thankful again for all that you've done for us and continue to do for us despite our opposition to you. Save those now that you've called this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Church, until next time, God bless you, God keep you, and we will see you hopefully soon.